All right. Well, it's uh, 12 p.m. Pacific has befallen us. Um, I'd like to thank you to everyone in the audience who was able to make it out today. And thank you especially to the hundreds of people who are actually currently on this Zoom live or watching it on Facebook as well. Um, I guess I can go ahead and uh, get uh, introductions started. Uh, my name is Stephen Sills, and I'm the current president of the Stanford College of Republicans. And I'm joined here by Sarah Olmsted, our social chair. And together we'll have the uh, privilege of being the moderators of today's uh, one hour Q&A. And for those who just joined in, we are once again honored to have the privilege of hosting Mr. Woodson at Stanford University. Uh, Mr. Woodson has served our country in the Air Force and was active in the civil rights movement during his youth and has since dedicated his life to advancing the welfare, welfare of low-income Americans through neighborhood revitalization projects. Towards the end in 1981, Robert Woodson founded the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise in Washington, which as a tribute to its founder, was just rechristened the Woodson Center in 2016. Mr. Woodson is a recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship, dubbed the Genius Grant, and the Presidential Citizens Medal. And this February, the Woodson Center launched the 1776 Unites Campaign, an intellectual movement of scholars and Americans dedicated to countering the divisive pseudo history of the New York Times 1619 Project, which attempts to define our nation on the basis of her greatest moral evil of slavery. And in the words of the 1776 Unites Movement description, uh, the purpose of the movement is to quote, liberate the tens of millions of Americans by helping them become agents of their own uplift and transformation by embracing the true founding values of our country. Robert Woodson is also the author of several books, including a new upcoming book titled Lessons from the Least of These, The Woodson Principles. And according to the book's description, this book is about the least among us and the extraordinary power of grassroots leaders who are transforming the lives of forgotten men and women in the most toxic neighborhoods. The strategies they applied in healing the most desperate communities also holds the key to healing our divided and empty nation today. And according to one quote I, I felt uh, that really resonated with me, uh, Woodson states that, quote, God does not choose the capable. Um, he chooses the called and then makes them capable. I think this captures a message of hope, encouragement, and empowerment I think we can all really resonate with today. Rest assured, I will be pre-ordering a copy of this book and I encourage every one of you out there in the audience to do the same. Um, me and Sarah again will be moderating a back and forth uh, Q&A discussion with Mr. Woodson at 12, uh, 12.30 p.m. Pacific time mark, uh, where members of the audience will have the opportunity to ask questions directly to Mr. Woodson under the, the Q&A tab listed at the bottom of the Zoom link, uh, which will be read either by Sarah or myself. And as always, we always encourage those who especially disagree with Mr. Woodson uh, to ask their questions first. And once again, I'd like to give our deepest gratitude to Mr. Woodson for joining us today. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Sarah to ask Mr. Woodson the first question we have. Yes, thank you so much for being here today, Mr. Woodson. Um, so for those who don't know, what is the 1619 Project and what is 1776 Unites? And why is 1776 the true birthday and history of America as opposed to uh, 1619. Good question. I'm pleased to be here. Uh, 1619 is a product of uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, who is a senior writer for the New York Times. She assembled a group of uh, uh, Black uh, journalists and others, uh, and they have issued, uh, published a series of essays in a special edition of the New York Times uh, Sunday Magazine section. And in there, essentially, she argues that 1776, uh, the signing of a Declaration of Independence is not the legitimate birth date of America, but 1619, this marks the date that 20 African slaves uh, arrived on our shores. And she goes on to argue that since uh, half of the members of the, uh, uh, who signed the Declaration of Independence were slave holders themselves, therefore the Declaration of Independence itself, therefore, is, is not legitimate and that America and capitalism was built on the backs of, of slavery and that uh, America is uh, 
irredeemably racist uh, and that all white people are privileged and therefore have profited and benefit from slavery and therefore they are to be punished with paying reparations and black people are victims of this system and therefore in need of compensation. They leave it there. We, uh, since they are, uh, and, and then they go on to denigrate capitalism, they denigrate uh, even the, 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 the uh, nuclear family. And so we think, we believe that since the this extreme left is using the conditions of black American as the bludgeon to really uh, attack and assault the fundamental values of our nation, it was important for the messengers in response to that to also be African-American. So we've gathered a, about 23 scholars, but not just scholars, but activists. And we have come together to really reinforce the notion that 1776 is our legitimate birthday. And we were not in, established to engage in a debate, but we wanted to offer an aspirational and an inspirational a response to it. If they are saying, for instance, that the conditions of out of wedlock birth, the kind of violence and unemployment that is uh, uh, rampant in low income black neighborhoods is a direct uh, uh, result of a legacy of slavery and Jim Crow. Well, we in our essays demonstrate that it is not the truth that black America has never been strictly defined by slavery and oppression and Jim Crow that it also has a legacy of resilience uh, and also uh, uh, capacity to respond uh, to in, in the face of slavery. We give examples in our essays, for instance, when blacks were denied access to hotels, we built our own. Every major city had a hotel. That when we were denied access to banks, we established our own banks. We even built our own railroad at one time. That uh, when we were denied access to schools, Julius Rosenwald, the uh, owner of the CEO of Sears, partnered with Booker T. Washington and built 5,000 Rosenwald schools. And between 1920 and 1940, we closed the education gap between whites and blacks in the South from three years to six months. So our essays uh, offer counter evidence and a counter narrative that a black America has never been defined or should never be defined by its birth defect of slavery. Slavery was horrible, but none of us should want to be defined by the worst of what we were when we were young, but America should be defined by its promise. We are the only nation on the face of the earth that fought a civil war to end slavery. We are the only nation with a, an emancipation proclamation. And so, uh, so that's what we are, we're issuing our own uh, curriculum that was just released three weeks ago. And there have been 5,000 downloads of our curriculum in just five days. So America is anxious to receive an alternative understanding of our history and that 1776 is our legitimate birthday. Awesome, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Mr. Woodson. Um, moving, I guess, uh, pivoting off of that, I think, to the next question. Um, you, you mentioned, right, the, you know, the fact that America's birthright and its promise extends to everyone. Uh, what would you say to some of the people, uh, you know, who recently witnessed the events of the summer who claim that this, this promise of America still doesn't necessarily uh, apply to them? Um, what would you maybe say to someone like Ibram Kendi, who actually spoke at Stanford um, two weeks ago, who claims that um, systemic racism is prevalent and it's everywhere, and anything, any existence of inequality, is um, racism. I, I guess the question is: Do you do you think that there is um, systemic racism affecting Black Americans uh, today? Why or why not? I, I'm not so sure what systemic racism is. I, I think it's a political construct. It's being used to really weaponize race in America. It's also used 
as a generalized way of, of avoiding certain critical questions. And the question that I would raise is if racism, if blacks were able to achieve and build institutions, if they were able to uh, build Wall Streets in the midst of de jure segregation, when racism was enshrined in the law, and, and we were able to build great institutions and thrive, that the greatest reduction in poverty occurred between 1940 and 1960, from 82% down to 35%, if we were able to make these gains in the presence of the jury segregation, then why can't we progress uh, in situations where those laws have been changed? What people like that who talk about institutional racism uh, uh, don't seem to, uh, uh, they're willing to answer, if racism were the culprit, then why are black children failing in institutions run by their own people for the past 50 years? Most of the cities of Cleveland, Newark, Washington, DC, Chicago, all of these cities have been run by liberal Democrats for 50 years. So how did these inequities develop under the leadership and all of the, the, the healthcare system, the housing programs, the, the prison systems have all primarily been managed and run by Blacks. Explain how institutional racism causes Black teachers to miseducate their children. I don't know how that works. Yes, thank you. A lot of us here agree. <laughs> so um, what, what do you think is the biggest difference between the civil rights movement that you participated in and the Black Lives Matter movement happening today? And maybe why does that difference matter? Well, first of all, the civil rights movement, uh, we saw inclusion. Not in, in other words, we also, celebrated the Declaration of Independence and the founding principles. What Dr. King and all of us fought for is to compel America to live up to its promise of equal opportunity. And America, by passing the Civil Rights Law, the Voting Rights Act, it, is, it was in a process of healing, a process of improvement. And year after year, we have seen dramatic advancements in, 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 in uh, situations in America for Blacks. So America is in the process of improving. That's why we have the Constitution. The Constitution is a mechanism for self-correction. And so the Civil Rights Movement was also, we saw peaceful change. The Black Lives Matter movement, uh, by accepting violence, the very fact that it might that that the civil rights movement was built on the embrace of bourgeois values, blacks America were able to survive slavery and Jim Crow because the strength of the nuclear family. In 1930 and 1940, black America's marriage rate was higher than any other group in society. And, and our elderly people could walk safely in our communities without fear of being assaulted. But all of that has changed. And so what Black Lives Matter is talking about, it has consanctioned, uh, it says that it's intended to assist Blacks. But in reality, nothing of what they do improves the conditions of poor Blacks and makes it worse. Whenever in the name of Black Lives Matter in Portland, they burn the Bible, the Christian Bible, they desecrate the Christian cross and say it's a, a symbol of white supremacy when they burned a flag, the, it, was, it was precisely the, the nuclear family and our Christian faith that delivered blacks from slavery and delivered it from, from oppression. And yet Black Lives Matter desecrates those very values that they were. So what they're doing now by, by attacking the police as being agents of white supremacy, Black Lives Matter, it's resulting in a dramatic increase on black on black murder. And so I wanna know what solutions do they have that if applied will improve the conditions 
in the in low income black communities? That's the question that they have to raise, but they, they, they can't answer it. And I guess um, even just ask, asking y'all for, for um, even your advice, what do you think um, we need to do to bring these movements dedicated towards black empowerment towards their proper center again? Uh, what, what, what is it that we need to do to empower black Americans so that they can seize onto the promise of the American dream? Well, first of all, there is a big disconnect between the goals of Black Lives Matter and the average black person. For instance, on the issue of police, they're talking about defunding the police. They're talking about abolishing police. 80% of black Americans want to, they're against defunding the police. 60% of blacks polled recently said that uh, they, are, uh, they don't feel racial discrimination is what's holding them back. And, and when you say systemic racism is the cause of our problem, if it was, then why is it that black Nigerians have an income and education higher than most white people? Uh, the second generation of Caribbeans who come here, they also enjoy uh, a wealth, uh, 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 in accumulation of wealth, education, graduate degrees, whatnot. And so if systemic racism were pervasive, then why doesn't it adversely affect these other groups of Blacks? And so these are the kind of troubling questions that Black Lives Matter does not answer. Um, so recently on Stanford campus, there has been a lot of talk towards critical race theory and a lot of um, anti-racist movements, including anti-racist autumn, which we're currently in. Um, do you think critical race theory has any credibility? And then off of that, what's your opinion on President Trump's ban on critical race theory? I agree that he should ban critical race theory. Critical race theory was really started by Marxists. They're just now applying it through a racial lens. But the Bolsheviks uh, came in, in in order to control the food supply. They had to create divisions among peasant farmers. So then they divided them up into various classes, the, the, the bottom and middle and the top. And then they went in to talk about what are the differences. So it agitated to promote this, this unity in that class. The same thing is happening today in America. We should, we should be defining ourselves as Dr. King said by the content of our character, not the color of our skin. I have nothing in common with a black who's out mugging and robbing people. I have nothing in common with a man that has a child and doesn't take care of it. But the assumption on critical race theory that all of us who, uh, who are of one race somehow think alike, act alike, and we have interests that are compatible. And that white people are forever evil. Uh, they are the recipients of privilege and therefore power must be shifted from them uh, to various groups that have been defined as marginalized. It's now morphed into uh, gays, uh, trans, and then there are all kinds of, the question is who makes the decision about who divides up the power? Who determines how does that power get redistributed? And so critical race theory is, is, has nothing but division to offer, it offers no solutions to this problem, critical race theory. All I know is also, in, 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 it's, it's profitable for someone when you can get uh, that, that we have these race grievance, uh, corporations are required to take uh, diversity training. Law firms are required to sign agreements. I mean, what kind of society are we but I really think that it's a hustle for a lot of people of profiting off of our disunity. Yeah, it's, 
uh, yeah, it, well, it is really, you know, it's distressing, right, to see the current uh, state of our country. I guess one question is, which actually isn't on um, the list that we have pre-written, but what do you think um, we need to do from a spiritual perspective um, to um, ensure that all Americans, right, are able to seize on to the promise because it's apparent that, um, you know, these people in Black Lives Matter, right, their intentions are real, they, their, their feelings at least are genuine, even if the premises are fundamentally mistaken. So what do we do to convince them that the promise of America still, you know, still, still is for them? Um, that, that's my question. Well, well, first of all, I think that Black Lives Matter and others who are supposed to be social justice warriors, who are George Floyd coming up saying, well, they're seeking justice for Blacks. Well, I really think that many in Black America need to withdraw the moral authority that they are exercising in their names. When I talk to them, I work in low income black neighborhoods all over this country that are, and we, we are generating solutions from within. There is nothing that white people can do or not do that's going to improve the conditions in these neighborhoods. They have to come from within. Black Lives Matter is against uh, Christian faith. It is against spiritual restoration. They're saying they are, they're European and therefore hostile. They are saying, for instance, that bourgeois values like uh, self, uh, denial of self gratification, delayed self gratification, hard work, uh, 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 self, self determination are all Western colonial constructs. Well, the worst thing you can do to any people is give them a convenient excuse for failing. And so the message that Black Lives Matter is conveying to particularly minority inner city people that if you're engaging in actions that are destructive to your ends, it's not your fault. You, because of the history of racism and because the existence of racism, you are exempt from any personal responsibility. So what we're doing at the Woodson Center, we are working internal to those communities we have created islands of excellence where young black men stop shooting and killing other young black men and women and begin to use their influence to rebuild those communities from the inside out and from the bottom up. So this is where we are, we, this is what the Woodson Center does is that we, we can take you to areas of this country where restoration and most of that restoration is built on a spiritual foundation uh, of, of convincing people to invest in themselves. All right, so we're going to jump over to the Q&A now. So one question we have is, do you think police brutality is a real issue in our country? And if so, how do we combat it? If not, why do you think that the agenda is being pushed? Well, first of all, I think that a lot of uh, black elected officials who have been running these cities for 50 years, where all of these so-called inequities are, exist, they are using the police as a scapegoat. They are saying that, well, the problem is, is, is systemic racism and that the police are agents of white supremacy. Well, who hired these police chiefs over the last 50 years? It was these same black elected officials. But they are now throwing the police under the bus. Someone once said, if we don't have fact-based truth, then lies become normal. Let me repeat that. If we don't have fact-based truth, then lies become normal. Again, let's look at the facts. In the course of one year, there are perhaps 1,000 people shot by the police, 1,000. 96% of them, they were, the, the police were assaulted. Only a false fraction are, are the George Floyd situation where 
blacks were unarmed and murdered. Maybe about 14 or 20 a year. But every time one of these incidents happened, we extrapolate from the one incident to an entire, that we indict, we engage in a racist construct and indict all police, act, police because of the action of one or two. Now, I believe that police should be held to a higher standard because they have the power of the state. But if we, if, if five blacks were shot by other blacks and we said, well, all blacks are like that, we would be calling that racist. Well, how can you therefore use that same construct and apply it to a police? But, but as a result of us, so, so when we're making a mistake, it's just not factual. Blacks kill more blacks. We have a 9-11 every three, every six months in, in America where blacks are killing blacks. We had 23 children in Chicago alone under the age of 10 killed, but it doesn't make news because it's only news when the villain is white and the victim is black. Moving on to uh, the next question from the audience, it's uh, quote, what are your thoughts on Ice Cube's contract for black Americans? I think Ice Cube has a constructive solution. He's not talking about blacks as America's victims to be compensated with reparations. Ice Cube is step stepping up with a serious recommendations about how to conduct uh, uh, economic conditions confronting black. He offered it to both the Democrats and the Republicans. The, re the, the Democrats, Democrats, Biden said, I'll talk to you after the election. The Trump administration spent three hours sitting down with him and adapted some of his recommendations. Ice Cube is right. We should not just pick sides based upon emotional issue, whether you are against or for racism, but we need to talk about what are solutions. And Ice Cube has a serious set of solutions on the table. And that's what we ought to be debating. We ought to be debating remedies, not whether or not institutional racism is an issue. We need to be talking remedy or defunding the police. Everything that Black Lives Matter is always in opposition to what exists it doesn't have any agenda for improving the health and safety of the people in whose name they say they're acting. Yes, thank you. So this next question says, and a quote, thank you so much for coming today, Bob Woodson. You have been instrumental in opening my eyes to understanding the history of black America in this country to know it's defined by resilience in the midst of oppression. My question is, what do you say to people who oppose school choice and need to funnel more tax dollars into already failing public schools? The biggest argument that leftists make is that instead of taking kids out of failing schools, why don't we just make those schools better? <clears throat> the reality is we have spent, Washington DC leads the nation in the per capita expenditures on schools. The issue isn't money, we spent more each year Yet we are 48th in outcomes for kids. There's no correlation between how much we spend on education and that. In fact, a recent study that I saw that said, I think in, in terms of the nation's report card on the status of education in America, that 37%, uh, now 24% of 12th graders are at the 24% level in terms of achievement and 37% in reading. Uh, and blacks, of course, are below that. So really, it's a race to the bottom. All children need to have their achievement levels raised, not just blacks to, to compared to whites, but all, all people. And choice has proven to be one effective way to introduce competition into education. Right now, our education system is like a banana republic. It's controlled by unions. You can't fire teachers. There's no accountability. The more we spend, 
There was a scandal back in 2011 in Atlanta where Beverly Hall, who was a super, black superintendent of schools, received a National Superintendent of the Year's Award for improving the grades of the black students. Well, they found out that's because the, the, the administration uh, uh, automatically raised, uh, falsified the grades and inflated them, even having pizza parties where they sit and then change and improve the grades. And some of those educators went to prison. But it was not a national scandal. These were all black administrators and black teachers doing this to black children. And the problem with looking at uh, uh, life through a racial prism, when the villains are black and the victims are black, it, it, it escapes public notice. Because under our present construct, the villain has to be white, the victim has to be black before it raises indignation, it promotes indignation. And that's one of the problems of critical race theory. When you look at life through a racial prism, it exempts people from personal responsibility by uh, looking at it through a racial prism and not one of character. Going on to our next question then, it's uh, quote, going off what you said about corporations and law firms a few years ago, I worked at, uh, one second. I worked at a very prominent tech company and I saw the stages of how, quote, the unconscious bias training got adopted there firsthand. The executives were very bright people, but the way they adopted this at the time, scientifically questionable approach with what seemed to be feigned, uh, feigned enthusiasm really disturbed me. And then they would intentionally publicize reports on their lack of diversity. Their demeanor as they feigned enthusiasm made me wonder if there was something behind the scenes forcing them to work against their own better judgment. Are you aware of any forces that work behind the scenes on executives like them to make them behave seemingly against their own interests? You know, Lenin, Lenin talked about this. He said that the American, he said industrialists will give us the money to buy the rope to hang them with. Just read it. This is what Lenin said. And he was right. And corporations are doing the same thing today. There's a very important book is by Michael Novak. It's called The Fire of Invention. When he talks about uh, corporations not having any operating philosophy, no way to define the corporate character to push back. It is feigned uh, uh, wokeness. And it does cause them to invest in. I think it's ironic that Nike invested in Black Lives Matter, and they looted their store in Chicago. <laughs> that to me is a metaphor for what we have going in America today. Hundreds of millions of dollars are being poured into that organization without anybody asking what the money is being used for. Go down in the south side of Chicago or in Newark, in any of those, those uh, cities, where there's a lack of funding for, for, for efforts and ask if any of that money is being spent there. All right, thank you. So going on to the next question, why is Marxism dangerous for black America? <laughs> why is Marxism dangerous? Because you have a totalitarian state where everything is dictated, some force outside, it doesn't depend upon your own individual initiative. What makes America exceptional is that you can produce and you will get rewarded. In our essays at 1776, we talk about several blacks who were born slaves who died millionaires. That would never happen under a, a socialist system. Biddy Mason, who was 18, born in 1818, a slave in Mississippi, and she had three babies. She walked behind a wagon for a thousand miles from Mississippi to Salt Lake City. 
and she delivered babies. And then later she went to California uh, as a, and, and found out it was a free state and she was uh, released. And she started as a midwife and made a dollar fifty a day, saved her money and purchased some land downtown and became wealthy uh, and a philanthropist. She's founded the AME church in Los Angeles that still exists today. And uh, she and others like her could only do this in a system of free enterprise system. So Marxism wouldn't permit a Biddy Mason to even think about starting a business. Because once you're in a certain class, the state determines what you produce, how you produce it, and where it is to be distributed. I guess going on to another question in the Q&A, it's, uh, quote, the poor education of inner city black youth is a crime. And what can we do for schools to stop the junior high to gang pipeline? What we can do, I think, first of all, is that we can support choice and vouchers and education to give parents the same options that middle-class people. I find in Washington, DC, for instance, the greatest opponents of choice and education with Jesse Jackson Jr., all the civil rights leaders uh, opposed choice and education. Marin Wright Edelman, the head of the Children's Defense Fund, all of them professional black civil rights people opposed choice and education. Not a single one of them had their children in the DC public schools. All of their children was in Sidwell, Friends, Bullis, Georgetown Academy. They all sent their children because they could afford to. At the same time, low income black parents were compelled to stay in these failing schools where teachers can't be fired for uh, poor performance. And so what we need to do is look for islands of excellence. We work closely with a group in Washington, DC in a public housing group where the residents decided that they are going to uh, uh, make sure they, they are mandatory studies, the parents and teachers uh, got together. They sent 680 kids in 10 years from a public housing project onto college because they said that their destiny is determined by what they are doing in their homes and not what somebody outside is doing. So it's a combination of investing in institutions that are indigenous to these communities. There's another example of, of educational excellence. There's a black boarding school, 110 years old, Pineywood in Pineywood, Mississippi. It only takes the families and children of, of at-risk uh, young people. But in 110 years, they, they as a Christian school, they have mandatory chapel uh, uh, uniforms, 10 hours of work is required every, every and there's discipline. 96% of these very high risk kids go on to college. Have, and so there are islands of excellence that demonstrates that once you give these kids from these very challenging backgrounds, a responsible institution that is committed to educating them that they can respond. Piney Wood is but one example of excellence in, 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 in action in these communities. And we need to support more institutions like this. Yes, thank you. So um, another question says, Thank you for bringing up critical race theory. In my graduate program, critical race theory is taught and taken as truth. There is no counter narratives offered and I'm afraid to voice my honest opinion. What would you recommend I do to keep myself centered when I'm around, when I'm surrounded by the <laughs> professors and classmates who argue the validity of critical race theory? Well, first of all, we would be delighted to, to if you were to go on our website uh, www.1776unites. We have some essays that really provides a counter narrative to critical race theory. That first of all, you can uh, come together 
uh, and and study, so you can you can be armed with arguments against it. Uh, uh, so that's what I can recommend, and I just hope and pray that students like you, in the name of freedom, will be given the opportunity to debate this. Is I'm afraid that debate is all missing on our campuses today. I went up to Harvard for the first time and spoke at the Kennedy School. And um, I heard some, uh, I went early to listen to the presenters. And what I heard is group think. And so when I asked the students, I don't hear anybody raising questions, challenging these presenters. And so what are, are we, are we, we are raising a class of students who are being taught to be cowards. And some of you who are opposed to that need to come together with others and to, to insist that you're given your First Amendment rights to challenge. Education used to be the place where you came and debated issues. It was a competition of ideas with the hallmark of a free society. But well, that sounds more like totalitarianism than it does democracy. If you want to know what life would look like under, under a communist system, look no further than putting a gag rule on the free, the free expression of ideas. But don't give up. <laughs> yes, one, an, another question from uh, a student is, uh, what do you say to students who attend elite universities but still claim to be oppressed? <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> you know, uh, everybody, everybody has their, their, their victim story. And, and as I said, I, I, I have suffered my last self-flagellating guilty white person and I suffered my last rich, angry black. <laughs> and, and I just think people need to be called out for that. I mean, it's just ridiculous for someone to, um, to, to be living in a lap of luxury and then complaining that they are a victim. I mean, it's becoming a political tool rather than a condition to be confronted. It's, it's a means of achieving power. It has nothing to do with uh, conditioning. But I hope that whites begin to suffer uh, race fatigue and push back against some of this. Yes, thank you. So uh, another question says, how do you handle the blowback that you inevitably get as a black leader willing to criticize other black leaders when they falter? It's very interesting. I don't get much blowback because 80% of my closest friends are X something. They have letters in front of their names, not in back of them. So my reputation is that, that I work in low income, high crime neighborhoods. Uh, my history is helping to mediate gang truce. Uh, so the reputation that the Woodson Center has is for problem solving in these very troubled neighborhoods. So the fact that this is what we do on a daily basis. And that my whole history in civil rights uh, sort of gives me the authority to speak to these issues in ways that perhaps others cannot. But I haven't gotten much blowback. In fact, I uh, debated the head of Black Lives Matter. You can go on uh, uh, the YouTube and, and see my debate with uh, the head of New York chapter of Black Lives Matter. Uh, and see, uh, you know, what that looks like. I keep waiting to be picketed. I would love it. <laughs> I would love it. I guess off of that, um, well, what are your thoughts on affirmative action? And well, this is important, especially because in California, at least, is Proposition 16, um, which is uh, removes, which is removing um, protections on the basis of class, race, um, and gender. Um, and how 
has it changed since when it was first enacted? And what are some of the benefits and problems it carries today? Well, first of all, as a civil rights activist, um, I felt that affirmative action should have been an ambulance service, not morph into a transportation system. And what do I mean by that? I mean, if you have a town that's 50% black and there are no blacks on the fire department and the police department or any other institutions, you need to take some extra steps <laughs> to change that. Well, that extra step was the voting rights bill. <laughs> Once the voting rights bill was passed, it meant that we got access to political power and then political power translated into control of the institutions within these municipalities. And so I thought that affirmative action would be fine for a few years until Voting Rights Act had an opportunity to kick in and then we will let that decide. But for some has become a whole transportation system and, and, and it has been really harmful to, to Blacks because of its uh, abuse. Let me give you an example of what I mean by an abuse. When they say that 10% of the contracts uh, in a construction industry has to be given to Blacks and then they extend it to other minorities, including women. Well, a lot of the white wives of construction companies got certified as an um, A day or set aside. And a lot of those contracts went to them. Another example is a guy I know who had a construction company. He bidded on the Alaskan pipelines, a $3 million contract. And the purpose of affirmative action was to give blacks an opportunity to bid on contract and create jobs for other blacks, which is noble. But what happens under the affirmative action program in practice, he successfully bid it on a $3 million uh, contract. He takes $300,000 and subs it back to the white company that came in second, which meant that he walks away with a windfall and the white company then has the contract and hires all white workers. So, and that's just one small example of how affirmative action has been exploited by an elite group of people in the name of helping all blacks. It ends up uh, prospering just a limited few because of the corruption of the program. And I could give you endless examples of that. So um, another question says, thank you for appearing here today. How would you explain contradictions I hear in what you say? You support free exchange of ideas, yet say critical race theory should be banned and capitalism is the solution, yet the poorest need financial support for education. Well, first of all, when I say banned, I don't mean banned from discussion. I meant you taught, they were asking me about the president. The president banned federal agencies from requiring it training, critical race theory training in its various departments. That's what he banned which I agree with, where federal employees were required to take courses and seminars on critical race theory. I'm against requiring government to do that. I don't want my tax money spent on that. But I was not referring to banning the discussion of it or the introduction, no, we need to debate it. But what I, so my ban was limited to what the, what the president did. I was asked about what I thought of his banning of it the president only has the power to ban it in government contracting. So that's what my, that's where that was. Was there a second part of that question? I don't think so, was it? No. Yeah. 
So, um, yeah, next question um, from the audience is, uh, well, what do you think it'll take to bring our country together? In the past, during great tragedies and wars, is the only time the whole country came together, World War II, 9-11, et cetera. Will it require another tragedy of this magnitude to get people to have common sense again? I hope not, but one of the things that we are doing at the Woodson Center is that the whole premise of Black Lives Matter and the whole race grievance industry is that they're doing this in the name of social justice for Blacks. I'm trying to mobilize low-income Blacks to speak out and to stand up and say they do not represent us, that we are against policies that would denigrate hard work. We're against policies that says that showing the work on time is being white. We are against people who say that meritocracy should be eliminated. We are against people who burn the Christian Bibles. So it's really what we can do is, is come in and support the voices within the black community that can speak up and say they do not represent us. So Black Lives Matter has to have its moral authority delegitimized. And that can only happen when Blacks say, stand up, particularly low-income Blacks, and say they do not speak for us. They speak for themselves. But also we can come together when, I'll give you an example. When Americans see virtue in action, there's an instant response. For instance, a few years back, a homeless man in Boston who was about 45 years old found a knapsack with about $46,000 in it. He turned it into the police. Somebody posted a GoFundMe page. They raised $93,000 in three days for that man. That happened at least four times in the country. And there was a huge outpouring of support I really believe deep in the DNA of the American character, there is a thirst to reward virtue. Rather than having some tragedy befall us to unite us, maybe there can be an outpouring of heroes who are acting morally, and then we can generate from their experience an outpouring. For another example of resilience, that mirrors what Biddy Mason did. There's a mom that had two daughters several years ago, and they were homeless for three years during their high school times. They were sleeping in the back of her car and in homeless shelters, and the girls were studying by the lights of their mother's cell phone. Those, one girl graduated salutedictorian, the other one graduated valedictorian, and they started college as sophomores because they took so many advanced placement classes. People like this that exhibit resilience, they need to be lionized. They need to be treated as celebrities. They are an example of, of not only grace in action, but resilience in the face of great challenges. And we need to find out how many more people living today have undergone and overcome those kinds of challenges. And there should be stories written about them. We should make movies about them. That's what we ought to be celebrating. I wholeheartedly agree with that and think that's a really, really great sentiment to have. Um, I was mistaken on the question where you asked if there was a second part. Um, there was a second part to uh, asking about contradictions and it was, how can you say basically that capitalism is great and that we need capitalism whenever you advocate for, um, I'm sorry, I, de I deleted the question, but I believe it said something like, how can you, um, oh, Capitalism is a solution, yet the poorest need financial support for education. That was the second part to the question. 
I, I didn't understand the question. Uh, that, that, that the that the like I said before, there is no correlation on how much we spend in education and outcomes for kids. There's just no correlation between that. I can take you to uh, school systems that spend twenty three thousand dollars per student, and the performance of the students are just abysmal. So there's just no there's no correlation there. And the other thing on capitalism, why is it that people of color from all over the world are risking their lives to get here? There's such an example of, and, it's, and, and how they come is very interesting. If you want to do an interesting study, there's a place in Houston, Texas called the Bel Air section. It was settled many years ago by Vietnamese boat people. It was a rundown, isolated, desolate area of the city very undesirable. But these people got off those boats and went there and started living ten to a room, starting restaurants. Now it's a thriving area with its own radio stations, newspapers. It's called Little Vietnam. It's very interesting that the people who created that came over on boats and the Vietnamese who came sponsored by families didn't prosper as much as those who came on boats. So that says, speaks volumes about the values of this free enterprise system that, that refugees could come in boats and, cre and create wealth that not only benefits them, but benefits all of the citizens of Houston. I guess um, here we have a good substantive uh, question which deals with a uh, question of history. Um, it's which was asked earlier, and that's a quote. Many people on the left claim that progress was not possible in America for blacks because of segregation. Yet many studies have shown that the black community was more prosperous and the medium household income was higher prior to the Civil Rights Act. So following 1964, uh, single, single motherhood and poverty skyrocketed. So what do you think or what do you believe contributed to the quote decline in the black community? that the, the, the writer is absolutely correct, that the biggest gains were made from after slavery up until the 1960s, and that's because 82% of all black families had a man and a woman raising children. There was a deliberate attempt on the part of social scientists Clown and Piven at Columbia University School of Social Work. They offered a thesis, they're saying they were socialists, and they said the way you address poverty is to promote the redistribution of income in America. And so this was right after the Watts riot. So what they did, they said, if we can separate work from income, it will mean that the man father is, is, is redundant. Uh, and if we can encourage people to see welfare as reparations. Well, they were ha helped by the poverty programs that opened offices that encouraged people to come in. The women's movement also supported the uh, assault on the, on the nuclear family. The black power movement said the nuclear family is Eurocentric and therefore racist, so they contributed. So you had the combination of the government encouraging people, reducing the barriers, and within a five, four year window in the 70s, millions of blacks flooded into the welfare system at a time when the unemployment rate in New York was 4% for black males. So what the clown and Piven predicted came true. You saw the dropouts from schools because of the, the, the disintegration of the family, school dropouts, drug addiction, crime, violence, all of those things attended those kind of cataclysmic changes. Plus urban renewal wiped out centers of commercial uh, activity in the black community and the poverty program wiped out moral centers of influence. So you got moral centers of influence decimated. You got economic centers of influence decimated at the same time. Well, that, that, was, that was a great answer. Um, actually, it's uh, if you can afford um, one, one minute of your time, we actually have one, one last question um, from, yeah, from the audience. Oh, awesome. Th thanks, thanks, Mr. Woodson. Um, the, the question is, quote, 
In addition to advocating improve, improvement for black and white race relations, what are your suggestions on how to improve black and Asian and black and Latino race relations? I really think that we need to do away with these racial categories. You know, my relationships are based upon whether you're my kind, not you my color. <laughs> and, and that's what we ought to be doing, talking about, about uh, 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 what we call it. And so we must really, uh, we must deracialize race in America and desegregate poverty. And so, and, and the way you do it is just do it. We have, uh, for instance, my friend, John Sidley Butler at the University of Texas at Austin. He's the foremost authority on the history of blacks in business. John had a fascinating conference some years ago where he invited all of these groups to come together to talk about their strategies of capital formation. <laughs> for instance, the Pakistanis control 40% of the restaurants in Austin, Texas. They were invited and what they do, they loan money to other Pakistanis who want to get into business, $25,000 interest free. They have their own MasterCard and their own language. Chinese people came in, Koreans, uh, others shared uh, unique ways of capital for getting capital to others to start business. So when we come together with an agenda of solutions, then the relationships will develop. We have a, uh, a, a system at all of the Woodson Center conferences you cannot come to any one of our conferences and bring up a problem for which you don't have a solution. It may not be the solution, but it has to be a solution. And so we ought to, we ought to have groups of people coming together, pursuing a common cause. And the byproduct of that will be uh, a solution. I mean, will be harmony. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Woodson, um, for your, your thought-provoking re responses. I'm, I'm sure a lot of Stanford students really, you know, and members of the public really valued from the um, unique insight, right, that you, you have provided for us. So we're, we're very grateful for you for giving us that today. And to everyone um, who is tuning in, uh, Liber isn't able to watch watch it, uh, now that the recording of this broadcast is also available on our Facebook, if you would like to uh, watch it again at another time. I'd like to again, thank everyone for coming, especially you, Mr. Woodson, and have a great